Welcome, bienvenidos to the first lecture, Diversity, Medialities, organized as cooperation between the Maria Civila Median Center um, and the Ibero-American Institute. Um, my name is Clara Rubituso. I am postdoc researcher at Mesila, coordinating the research area Medialities of Conviviality at the Ibero-American Institute. I will moderate today this first discussion and exchange. And before I introduce to you our speaker, I will mention very shortly the idea of the public lectures, diversity medialities. Um, the proposal is to thematize and discuss with experts and activists the general question of diversity, inclusion, exclusion, inequalities in Latin America, to exchange on how various interdependent conditions of oppression and inequality are reflected in exclusion, but also in the articulation of differentiated demands and struggles. Focusing especially on the production and circulation of knowledge from the margins, from the peripheries, its form and medias, the local and transnational exchanges and strategies. Our first guest is Vinicius Anoli. Vinicius is a DFG Walter Benjamin Fellow at the Institute for Latin American Studies at the Freie Universität Berlin. He's also fellow researcher of the Nestor Berlonger Research Centers on Cities, Sexualities and Generation of the Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sul, Brazil, and a member of the LGBTQIA plus network of Latin American archives, museums, collections, and researchers. He holds a PhD in social sciences from the University of Campinas, Brazil, where he also completed his master in social anthropology. He's the author of the book, Bradando contra todas las opresores, Ativismos LGTB, Negros, Populares e Periféricos en Relación, um, I translate, shouting against all oppression, LGBT, black, popular, and peripheral activism in relation, published by Editora de Vides and available in the EIE library. And his lecture today is entitled, Why Intersectional Activism Matters, Notes on the Afro-LGBTI Brazilian Experience. Thank you for accepting the invitation and I give you the word. So thank you very much and good evening or good afternoon, good morning, depending where you are. Uh, I'd like to start thanking Professor Professor Schütze, who is my supervisor at the postdoc, for putting me in contact with Mesilla researchers, especially Dr. Clara Hovitoso. Clara for invite me, inviting me to do this presentation. Uh, Mesila and the Ibero-Americanische Institute for having me, and of course, everyone who's here watching us. So for the presentation structured, what I had thought was a general introduction, followed by a, uh, an explanation on my doctoral research and its main contributions, because it's in which the presentation is based, on which uh, intersectionality, the LGBTQI movement in Brazil and its relationships with the Black movement. And finally, talk a bit about the Black LGBTQI organization I have conducted field work with, which is Os Brados. So, as Clara told, we are based in the discussion in my book, which was published by Davides. Uh, it's also available at Amazon. On Amazon, I discovered recently, so as an ebook. It's not an ebook for Kindle, it's a print replica, so it's a bit different, but and let's move to the doctoral research. It was an ethnography about the political trajectory and network of Aos Brados, which is a black LGBTQI group from the peripheries. Uh, something it was a, something hard to translate. So in Portuguese it would be um grupo LGBT negro da periferia. Uh, the methods applied were participant observation in-depth interviews and documentary analysis. Uh, participant observation and documentary analysis were the main methods, actually. I have conducted some interviews, but they were minor compared to the others. 
I conducted field work between 2000 and early 2015 and late 2018, but I also used material from my master's dissertation since I have got contact with Os Brados since 2013. So I had some material out of the, the first field work. And as I said before, the focus of the ethnography was on Os Brados. The name of the group means would mean something translating as shouting or uh, yeah, crying out loud. And it comes from the interpretation of the activists that they didn't have voice in mainstream LGBTI organizations or movements. And so they have to shout in order to be heard. And it was founded in Campinas, in the state of Sao Paulo, Brazil, in 1998. Until 2008, uh, it was it, it, uh, the activists conceived the group as an LGBT group from the peripheries. And since 2018, there has been a change in the group political identity, and they conceived themselves as a black LGBT group from the peripheries. The group acts among a complex network that connects different movements such as LGBT organizations, Black and Afro-descendant cultural movements, political parties, trade unions, and others. So the different movements are here in quotation marks because one of the arguments of the research is that keep, keep, studying, movements keep studying movements focusing on how they define themselves, or better, keep defining the movements from an analytical point of view through identity is something that is not useful. So it's important to take to see how they identify themselves, but not to cut the network by their identity. So not to see, so this is black movement, this is LGBTI movement, because when we do so, we fail to address their interconnections, which was very important, were very important for this research in particular. And I'm going to talk more about the group soon, but before I will explain a bit about the theoretical framework of the research. And so I had contact with this book of Nilma Lino Gomes that I'm talking about, which is uh, O Movimento Negro Educador. On, uh, the, the, so this book I'm talking about on this slide, actually after finishing the research. However, in later publications, such as articles, I have incorporated it because it really helps to analyze what I was dealing with while doing the research. And it's also, so it also, something that links what I've done with the um, bigger picture of this area of Mesilla, because uh, Nima Lino Gomes proposes that social movements produce knowledge, that black movement produce knowledge. She's doing the, the book on black no movement, but she's proposing it's not only the black movement that does that. She, she took the, the, the uh, so she based the research on black movement, but social movements produce knowledge. And on the same manner, social movement theory or studies have emphasized that move, movements produce meaning through what they call framing processes, which would, uh, would be something that, so this meaning they produce has a, has a central objective to explain what or who they are fighting for and against but also what are the claims, their claims, and et cetera. So inspired by Gomez, we can say that when doing so, when producing meaning, they are also producing knowledge. Since to explain their demands, they need to call the attention to social problems they face and the people they represent face. And in doing so, they are producing, they are producing knowledge on their own situation or the situation of the people they are fighting, they are fighting for or against. Like they not they do that like in a material way too, like producing reports, but also uh theorizing about racial inequality or um uh, gender inequality, about uh, exclusion when they're doing so. So they are also producing knowledge. And as we are going to see, their political relationships, the networks in the in which the activists are embedded, uh are also important because they through these networks, they exchange knowledge on how to act, how to portray the action, and how to then find themselves to the public. So, in a broader picture, what I'm saying is that the uh, 
there is this exchange, so knowledge circulates within these movements, and we think the limits are what we have been calling different movements. And so, theoretically speaking, I use the term intersectional activism to address the way Os Brados and, of course, other groups act. And so, uh, here, the, this is like a metaphor, an example. Uh, in green, you see LGBT activism, in purple, black activism, and in light pink, peripheral activism. This is a translation. So, uh, we would say movimento periférico in Portuguese, which sounds a bit funny to say peripheral activism in English. So, uh, maybe activism from the peripheries. And in between, in the middle of the, these circles intersecting, organizations such as Aos Brados, they are there and they circulate throughout these different, uh, these different movements. And so I'm calling it this way of acting, intersectional activism. And the theoretical argument of the work, it's based already on what, of course, uh, social movement theory has been doing. And so I'm saying that repair to ours, which are the ways, the forms of action, the frames, the meaning associated with it, and the political identity, they inform each other and they change each other, but also that the political networks in which the activists are embedded are very important for change, mainly in the, and they are central in the consolidation of, of what I am calling intersectional activism. And the two main arguments of the book itself, so I understand the intersectionality in the case of the, the groups I'm studying, and in relation to other activisms, contemporary activism in Brazil as a frame or as a frame process, as a result of a production of meaning. And it mixes the, the political use of intersectionality and these claims of many groups that they fight against all or many kinds of oppression. So I'm calling these intersectional frame. And I, since it has gone beyond the limits of black feminism, what I'm saying, but that's I'm saying there are other movements using this idea. I'm I argue that this is a master frame. So in the frame perspective, a master frame is a frame that would go beyond the limits of one movement. Well, we are already problematizing the idea of these limits are not that rigid as the literature may 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 represent them. But so it's a master frame. These are the main arguments. And since we're talking about intersectional activism, it's important to discuss a bit what it is, what intersectionality is. So it's a notion coined by Kimberly Quinshaw, who is a lawyer, a professor of law, civil rights, and critical race theory. She's a civil rights activist and feminist in the US. She coined the notion to explain and analyze the reality of black women, particularly in the United States. And these notions, so although she was the first one to coin it and to name it that, it stems from black feminist and black women movements practices and knowledge in the United States. And that's very important because, so even the, uh, there have been discussions inside uh, uh, academic debates on intersectionality that the academic approach are just one face of it, and intersectionality is also political, and it uh, it was a project that was always uh, that always comprised uh, knowledge and practice or uh, praxis, and so and so the intersectional approach can be described through the metaphor of the intersection. Uh, here I put uh, sexuality, race, class, gender. I put sexuality here, but in the original Crenshaw's proposition, the main intersections would be race, class, and gender. However, according to some intersectional approach, many systems of oppression and or many markers of difference, there are differences on how they, they address this, they can intersect in someone's life or reality or in a group's life or reality. And so, as we've seen, there are many approaches to intersectionality and different approaches to intersectionality. 
Some focus on the more structural aspects, like I how structure inequalities intersect, intersect in a subject or group of people's lives, such as in the life of women of color, for instance. Or some others focus on the constitution of subjectivities or identities. Uh, some others see intersectionality as a mode of thinking, how multiple forms of differentiations and inequality, I mean, how they relate and they constitute themselves. Um, there are differences between American and British approach and how it was received in Latin America, how it's been used in the, in the global South, so politically and academically. And it's also important to stress that there, there are many other approaches on discussing this metaphor here. I, I, we can talk about later, maybe. And in the research cell itself, in a theoretical as a theoretical perspective. So, I mean, my own reading on intersectionality when I was doing the research, through what I read and mainly inspired by Abdur Bras' work, a cartography of diaspora. It's a way of thinking on how different social markers of difference, according to different social, cultural, and political contexts, can turn into processes of differentiation and or produce inequality, depending on the context. It's not to say there is no structural inequality, there is, but the context vary on how these structural inequalities work and intersect. And since we're talking about intersectional activism and the intersection in Os Brados case, the case we're going to talk later, the stronger intersection I, I had dealt with in the, the field work was between black movement and the LGBTQI movement. Uh, it's important to talk a bit about their relationship and a bit about them themselves. So authors analyzing black activism or black protest uh, in Brazil, they do not agree when this form of collective action emerged. However, they all agree it predates the 1970s. Uh, in general, the history of the black movement uh, is divided in three phases. Uh, the first organizations are usually the ones that uh, arose in the first decade, the decades of the 20th century, uh, like us. And so the main, the three main, the Black Press was one of uh, an important uh, group of organizations and uh, different newspapers around the country were part of the movement in a sense. The, in 1926, the foundation of Centro Cívico Palmares and in 1931, the foundation of Frente Negra Brasileira, something like Brazilian Black Front. And Brazilian Black Front had chapters in different states of the country, many states of the country. In the 1940s, uh, the groups that were more visible were União dos Homens de Cor, founded in Porto Alegre in 1943. Uh, this organization in the end of the 40s, like the Frente Negra Brasileira, they already had chapters in many different Brazilian states. And another important organization was Teatro Experimental do Negro, founded in Rio de Janeiro in 1944. And here, the Black Press had also an important role on uh, 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 diffus diffusing the knowledge produced by the movement and by the activists and also the political discussions. And although the movement predates the 70s, this was an important decade for it. So under the what we call in Brazil the political opening of the military dictatorship, different organizations and activists throughout the country founded Movimento Negro Unificado, Unified Black Movement, in 1978. This was an important milestone for black activism in Brazil. Um, they were they were part of and influenced by the different movements fighting against the military dictatorship. They had a strong Marxist um, discussion on class issues and a strong critique on the myth of racial equality in Brazil. And this idea that there is some, there is this uh, many different governments and many different uh, aspects of Brazilian culture, that this term is problematic, but 
uh, based, are based upon the idea that there is no racial inequality or racial discrimination in Brazil. And they have been criticizing that a lot. And one of the, the, the one of their propositions was to change the commemorations uh, of the black movement from the, the official commemorations of the end of slavery in Brazil to, to, uh, to commemorate Zumbi dos Palmares, which was an important leader. That's important also for the, the relationship with, with the um, LGBT movement. We're going to talk about that in a bit, but that's very important because these they 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 go against and they and they very fairly to that myth that um uh, that there was no fight from black people themselves to end slavery and so they have been they focus on the fight and not the 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 way the the state would have done it I mean and so in what concerns the LGBT movement. Most scholars tend to argue that it was formed in Brazil in 1978. They highlight the creation of the newspaper Lampion da Esquina and the foundation of Grupo Somos of, Sa Grupo Somos of Sao Paulo uh, as milestones of the movement's foundation. These, uh, the newspaper and, and Somos and the other organizations that arose after Somos were very uh, linked. It's important to highlight though that some scholars have challenged these, assum these assumptions uh, recently, taking prior articulations as the milestones of the foundation of the movements. So this is a debate. And how also to decide what's the movement, what was already the movement or not. So for instance, some authors have been calling the pre the the, the political articulations before the foundation of Somos as something as a movimentation. I think there movimentação. I think there is no translation to it into English. Uh, but some others claim that other other events were the ones that founded the homosexual movement in Brazil. On the same, I'm saying homosexual movement because that's the way it was portrayed publicly by the time. It was known as the homosexual movement. The, the 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 way it was defined changed throughout the time until LGBTQI or LGBTQI LGBTQI plus, and that's some other thing to discuss. But uh, that something that's also important is that these the more the more so most of the studies on social on the LGBTQI movement in Brazil highlight the influence of the U.S and Stonewall on the movement's foundation. But of course, they were already doing that. And right now that more source or sources are available and that there has been more interesting interest from history on LGBTQI movement. They, they, they are also showing how the movement in Brazil was influenced by other uh, gay and lesbian mobilizations, both in Europe and Latin America, as well as other countries in the global south. So Somos was founded in 1978, the same year as the Movimento Negro Unificado. And in 1979, their first public appearance at a march or a protest was at Zumbi dos Palmares Day, which was organized by Movimento Negro Unificado. Uh, the movement had different relationships with the, the movements with each other. So they already they also had some relationships mediated by Convergista Socialista, which was a leftist organization that had people in, both in the Movimento Negro Unificado and in the homosexual movement, and also and also the newspapers and uh, that were the Black Press and the and Somos and and Lampion, they also had different contexts. In 1980, after a split in Somos, the Grupo de Negros Homosexuais, Black Homosexual Groups, of Group of Black Homosexuals, uh, was founded. And that was a very important moment because, uh, so the first work, the first known work on LGBT, so the first ethnography on one LGBT organization in Brazil is Edward McRae's work on Grupo Somos. He was an anthropologist doing his 
diseases, I guess. And so it, within Somos activists, there was this idea that they formed a community of equals, uma comunidade de iguais. Uh, so they, they, they shared a lot of things and they shared their oppressions. And that was important to make uh, to, to, for the political identity of the group. However, the activists that formed the Black homosexual group stressed that uh, not only they were not all equals in the sense that uh, there are other inequalities and, and power relations playing a role, but they also suffered racism within the homosexual movement. And so they split with Somos, create their own group, and decided to concentrate the action, their actions within the Movimento Negro Unificado. According to Edward McRae and to recent research, historical research on this group on Negros Homosexuais, they had a short life, but they were very important in the foundation of another group in 1981 in Salvador, in Bahia, that was Adedo Du, that was founded in, in 1981 uh, as a dissidence of Grupo Gay da Bahia. They kept relations with the group, but they, it was also a dissidence. And the idea was the same, that they, there, there was the need of they so, so black LGBT people had specific needs. This idea is important that they had specific needs. When I talk about the other contributions of the research, because this idea of a specific was then taken by the literature on LGBT movements in Brazil, but you're going to go back there in a in some time. From the 19s 1990s on, different intersectional groups and networks were founded. Apart, for instance, from Aos Brados, which we are talking about today because it was my ethnography, uh, I stress Rede Afro LGBT, which is a network, a national network in Brazil, uh, Conexão G in Favela da Maré in Rio de Janeiro, which is a group of uh, LGBTI from the favelas in Rio de Janeiro, Rede Sapata, which is a network formed by women that are lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, and identify as Black, Indigenous, or from the traditional communities. And we also have groups in smaller cities and in the countryside too. For instance, in the city where I grew up, in the countryside of the state of São Paulo, uh, which is called Jundiaí, they have a group named Aquenda, which is a Black LGBTI group. And so uh, this is something that has, has uh, so it's not new and has been happening, this, what I'm calling intersectional activism. And, within these relationships within the Black movement and the LGBTQI movement. Having said that, I want to talk again about what I'm calling intersectional activism. So as I just said, this is not new. Uh, however, when I started doing the theses, it was not very discussed by the literature. Um, most works would talk about uh, these intersectional groups when they were talking uh, on the broader pictures about LGBTI activism without addressing them individually or as a, as a group, they were they would also do it. Uh, so most of the works on LGBTI movement in Brazil, it's been changing now, has been done by anthropologists. I'm an anthropologist myself, and we tend sometimes to borrow categories from from our interlocutors. And so, as I was telling before. This idea that the, the activists had specific needs has made some anthropologists and some people uh, studying LGBTQI movement to call these movements Black LGBTQI organizations, peripheral LGBTQI organizations, Black lesbian women organizations as specific groups, or to look at their creation as processes of specification. So they understand, uh, so the, what they are calling processes of specification would be a result of uh, the fight for funding and, and the adequacy to state language, which was influenced by the adoption of the, of the, of the, the oh, I forgot the word, sorry. Uh, the adoption of the Durban policies based on the Durban Conference Against Racism. And so to, adequ uh, to adequate themselves in a language that would talk about 
intersectionality, uh, and also to, sh to show to the to the funding bodies and the, to the government, which was the main funding body of the LGBT movement in Brazil before the crisis, the, the political crisis Brazil has gone through after the that culminated in the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff and then the election of the actual president, which I will not name right now. Uh, the, the, the action of the, the, the contemporary president. president. Um, after the, uh, before this crisis, they had to fight for funding and this idea that they had to prove they were doing something specific. And so to be more, more competitive than the others. Although I'm not saying this is wrong, I'm saying this does not uh, explain everything. So, so first, because there were groups before the these, right? Before the Durban conference. Second, before because the black movement itself has a strong role, mainly black feminists and Afro descendant women's movements in Brazil, on applying what was what has been decided in, in Durban in being impressing. They also had a strong role in pressing the government on applying the urban. I forgot the word for that. Sorry, the decisions of the urban conference. And so I'm saying that this explained part of it. But what I saw in the field and reading other people doing the work uh, with what I'm calling intersectional activism, while I was doing, is that the relationships and exchange among social movements were also central in the consolidation of their intersectional activism, in creating them on the, on the one hand and on, 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 on making it possible. And having said all that, I'll start to talk about my field work and it happened in Campinas. So you are seeing here a map in the bottom left corner you are seeing a map of Brazil in red, you see the state of Sao Paulo. And in the bigger map, you see Campinas in red in the state of Sao Paulo. So Campinas is in the southeast of the country. It's the center of a metropolitan region. It's the third, so it's, uh, it has more than 1 million inhabitants. It's the third biggest city in Sao Paulo in the 20th in Brazil. And it's the house of important organizations of the LGBTI movement with links to national and transnational organizations. And so, as we were telling you before, and now I'm going to talk about the centrality of cross movement relationships, re relationships in intersectional activism. To, in, to do so, I will talk a bit about the political trajectory, tra 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 sorry, trajectory of Lucia Castro who was the, the founder of Os Brados and who is up until today, one of the few members that have been in the group since the beginning. So the group has more than 20 years of existence and her personal trajectory is important because it's very, so the trajectory of the group is very linked to her personal trajectory. So she was expelled from home for being a lesbian while she was still young. And then she moved to a peripheral neighborhood, to the outskirts. And there she got in contact with peripheral movements, housing movements, homeless movements, community organizations. And from these movements, she met she, people in the Workers' Party, the PT, Partido dos Trabalhadores. From the PT, she had contact with people in Expressão, which was the first LGBT organization of Campinas founded in 1995 from the uh, popular movement Central, CMP, CMP, Central dos Movimentos Populares, and CUTI, which is the uh, Trade Union Central, Central Unica dos Trabalhadores. But it's a trade, it's a trade union umbrella organization. And it made her, so she was part. She was part of the first group that left Expressão to find to found the second LGBTI group of Campinas, which was Identidade. But in the same year, she was part of the foundation of Identidade. She and some friends decided to to found Os Brados. So uh, here you see uh, the 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 cover of the newspaper. I'll, I'll talk about that on a 
soon. So it was founded in 1998, Os Brados, as a dissidence of identidade, the second LGBT group of Campinas. And one of the main, so they explain that they need, that they are, their, experience, their experience was very different from the experience of white, uh, although race was not a, a marker of difference in their political identity yet, they were, didn't consider themselves black LGBTQI from the peripheries, they were LGBTQI from the peripheries, the, the, the fact that, that gay white men or gay white LGBTQI people, but mainly gay and lesbians, they, they had very different experiences compared to people in the peripheries. So, for instance, uh, Identidad already used email lists to keep contact with different activist networks within Brazil and outside Brazil. And one of the main critiques on that is that these focus could get them so they were not um, communicating with the periphery because it was not easy nor cheap to get access to the internet in Brazil in 1998. And if you lived in the outskirts, if you were not middle, upper middle class or middle class, it was much harder, which was the case of man, man, many members of Os Brados. And so they decided to create a newspaper to communicate with the periphery and shortly, part of this group that was part of Identidade and that lived mainly in the periphery, they decided to leave Identidade and focus only on the newspaper. They were offered a room to, to, to work on the Central Única dos Trabalhadores, uh, which they share with a sexual workers organization. They are a sexual workers union, actually. And, and then they started just to publish the journal for a while, the newspaper, but according to them, influenced by their relationships with the trade unions and with the, with the PT. So Lucia is, is a, is an affiliated member of the party. And at, by then, by uh, some years after that in 2002, yes, the PT was oh, and start, so was also in the presidency, right? So influenced by all this political climate, they decided to institutionalize, uh, to become an uh, to become an official institution. Their first idea was to become a research institute and to produce knowledge on the reality of LGBTI from the periphery and try to from that to to in to inside in political in public policies and stuff like that they didn't uh get to become an institute in the sense that they don't have a juridical registration and but they did perform some research and they have they also had another line of work which was doing these formations for people that needed work so Educational education courses on how to do artwork or or how to sell uh, uh, how to sell certain products or how to get how to how to prepare your CV to enhance the possibilities of uh, LGBT from the peripheries to get a job. And, but apart from that. Their main, their real main actions, public actions, were what they called social actions. There were two, Brados Papu, in citizenship, visibility, citizenship and visibility. Uh, that Brados Papu, so Brados comes from the name of the group, Brados. Papu is something as chatting, like talking to someone. And the idea, so they define it, they, they, they themselves define it as talks to demystify homosexuality in a sense that they would be invited by LGBTQI people in different peripheral communities of the metropolitan region of Campinas. It's not just the city, but the, the other cities that are in the outskirts as well. To give talks, to explain that it was, to explain what it is to be, what is homosexuality and to discuss LGBTQI rights and that was one thing, one of the, the, the 
the projects. The other was these free haircuts and sometimes also uh, talks on HIV prevention. These free haircuts and talks on HIV prevention were given by mainly by uh, transgender women and gay men who worked as hairdressers. And the idea here was that by showing to poor communities that the people that lived there could help them, they could fight homophobia and transphobia within these, these communities. So connecting LGBTI people with them. And so this is the first, what I call the first phase of the group, which went up until 2008, more or less. And as we can see, it was strongly influenced by uh, the leftist organizations they had contact with and the trade unions. And from 2008, first Lucia, the leader, but also other members, they started to get contact with what they call, my interlocutors call, the cultural black movement, which are organizations that work on the safeguard and on the promotion of Afro-descendant, Afro-Brazilian and black culture and tradition. And from that, they understood that uh, before that, according to interviews, they thought that saying that, that they were from the peripheries would explain that they were also fighting against racism. However, they understood that it was very important to stress that they were also fighting against racism. And so to emphasize, because most of the activists of the group were, were black people, that they were a black LGBTQI group from the peripheries. And with these change in identity and these new relationships, we also had changes in how they get. They still, they went on doing something alike the cultural, the social activities, of course, but they also started to do, and they were, their main activities were what they, they themselves called cultural activities. But we are going to talk now. So most of the cultural activities comes from the idea that there is a lack of representation of black and LGBTI people from the peripheries, both in cultural events from the LGBTI movement and the Black uh, movement, or the Afro-descendant cultural movements in the city. And so, for instance, one of the things that uh, Os Brados was part of the Pride Parade Committee of the city, and the, one of the things that they highlighted during the, I was doing field work there too, in the Pride Parade, was the need for more black and periphery artists on the stages of the the events that composed the uh, sexual diversity month would be the translation of the this month where many activities are organized with, within the city by the pride parade committee and but also on on the other hand that other the uh, black groups should have LGBT artists doing black culture culture. And so these activities are mainly they have mainly music, dance, and drag queen performances. They usually invite LGBT artists, not necessarily black LGBT from the peripheries, but mainly black LGBT artists. So there are also white LGBT artists, for instance, it can happen. Uh, feminist artists. Um, the music and the dance and the performances, they, tur they turn around, they go around a hip, hip hop, samba, but also Brazilian popular music, songs linked to Umbanda and Candomblé, which are Brazilian Afro-Brazilian Afro religions, and also tributes to Black Brazilian female singers. And it's interesting because in a way, their activities are very similar to the activities that both the Black cultural movement, but also the peripheral cultural movements are organizing in the city. So, for instance, there is a one of their main their main uh, interlocutors, their main partners is Comunidade de Jongo de Ribeiro, which is a black traditional community in the city in the city um, that coordinates the ref de Jongo of Sudeste of Southeast. Jungle of Southeast Reference Center. 
and they also organize a lot of cultural activities. And one study on their actions uh, emphasize that, for instance, they organize one of the events they organize is one of their main events, a Hayao Afro Julino, which is a uh, party that so a kind of festival that happens that are very common in June and July in Brazil, Festas Juninas. And they are not necessarily linked with black culture. I mean, in the sense of it, Festas Juninas, but they do so in a way that they turn it in an Afro Julino Arraial. So they bring uh, black performers and uh, traditional black culture uh, presentations like Jongo, but not other, not, not, not only Jongo is the the traditional form of singing and dancing and expressing, it's much more complicated than only singing and dancing, that they safeguard. And they turn it in, into Afro. And so that's the same idea with Osbrado's activities. They are mainly two, Feijoada da Diversidade or Feijuca da Diversidade and uh, Pedala Bicha. So Feijuca da Diversidade, Feijuca is the slang for Feijoada, which is an Afro-Brazilian traditional dish, uh, usually made out of black beans, uh, stewed pork, bling, pork, black beans, pork, and it's usually served with um, cassava flour, rice, and sometimes with orange. It depends, and it's it has a link. Uh, it's linked to Afro-Brazilian religions as well. It's a comida de santo. Um, mm -hmm. It's one food for an Orisha because uh, Afro-Brazilian religions are very linked to food, but that's another discussion. I mean, in the open, I cannot go much on there because of the time too. And up until 2016, they were cared, these activities, the Fejuca da Diversidade, were cared at Fazenda Roseira, which is the house of Jongo Dito Ribeiro community. They were mainly composed of music and drag queen presentations, but also lots of different black artists and peripheral, peripheral artists presentations. The songs and the, the lyrics and the characterization were strongly linked to uh, the to a portrayal of black culture. So, for instance, there is always some drag queen doing a uh, tribute to Anurisha, which is a, an Afro-Brazilian deity, like a god. Um, and and so it's they they borrow a lot from these cultural black movements. The other main activity is a bit different, is a bike ride through the city, but it was specifically designed to go through some some streets where back black back black people have been segregated in the past. Uh they are their attendance in these streets were not easily done, even after the end of the slavery period in Brazil, officially, right? And uh, one of the of the strategies is to link, to talk about gentrification, to criticize how the city. So these neighborhoods, the central neighborhoods, were traditionally in the past black neighborhoods and how black people have been taken out and had to live more and more in the outskirts, but also criticizing how it's hard to LGBT people to, to openly demonstrate affection or to exist for trans people, for instance, in public, and to, at the same time, to, talking about why you are, so everybody's riding or a bike or skates and many in drag, and while they are riding, there is someone talking, usually Lucia or some other activists, about these things. And also strongly linking, uh, talking about Black LGBTQI realities in one sense, but also linking, linking saying that uh, oppression suffered by Black people that are not necessarily Black, but LGBT people that are not necessarily Black, and Black people that are not necessarily LGBTQI, that they are correlated. They are not the same, they are different, but that they are correlated. They both are segregated for, from uh, public spaces from, from different reasons, for instance. And this specifically is very interesting because apart from borrowing from the cultural 
movement, it also borrows traditional protests from the black movements, from protest movements, black movements. But it also ends with a cultural presentation in the end in a big stage in one of the main squares of the city where protests take place. And so to finish it, it's also important to say that there is mutual influences between the movements, right? So I'm putting all battles here, but CS LGBT I movement. So local black collectives have been inviting Els Brados activists to give drag queen workshops or inviting artists to perform in other black collective events. Local black collectives that have been organizing collective marriages include couples formed by LGBT people and stress that uh, some gender norms in, in this Jongo community were reinterpret, reinterpreted. So for instance, in Roda de Jongo, it's this event where people sing and dance together. It's usually separated by gender and men and women dance together. And Lucia, which is the founder of Os Brados, she's not, and they have to dress in a way, she's not comfortable in dressing as it's perceived to, see, to dress as a woman. And she convinced, uh, after some time, the elder of the, of the group that if she dressed as a man and to, to, to dance with women, they, she was not, um, uh, she was not uh, uh, jeopardizing the tradition, but they were just adjusting it to to new body to uh, to other bodies and other uh, gender identities. And so these are just examples, but this is something very important for for her, for instance, because she she, she sees this that this thing that's in Rodo de Jongo as one of the things that Aos Brados influenced strongly these black communities. And so thank you very much. And here's my contact if anyone is interested.